I've dedicated myself to cataloging and rating every mystery box story. The mystery box story is a recent genre of fiction, and this is its basic definition. For more in-depth explanation, check the title card. I've also outlined 10 criteria that I use to judge whether a particular mystery box story is an effective one. This episode, I'm covering the most complicated mystery box there is. Dark. So a big theme that I like to bring up regarding mystery box stories is that they ask a lot from their audience. Modern media has gotten a lot more complex in the last few decades, and we've come a long way from the days where everything on TV was a lighthearted sitcom. Mystery box TV shows, and also plenty of other kinds of TV shows, throw a ton of information at the viewer and make them grapple with huge detailed plot lines. I feel like Netflix's Dark is the natural culmination of that idea. Watching this show, you basically need to take notes the whole time to keep track of what's going on. It premiered in 2017 as Netflix's first German language series, and it's a time travel sci-fi drama. There's the key word that makes the show's plot so hard to follow. Time travel. Any time travel story is bound to get weird fast, and Dark is no exception. What makes it different is its use of a mystery box structure to organize and present the information to the viewer. With those two ideas combined, Dark easily becomes the most complicated TV show I've ever watched. But is it a good mystery box story? Does the plot's complexity make it more compelling, or is it all just a smokescreen to cover up a lackluster story? Let's discuss. To start, what is this show about? And does the opening premise involve a central mystery? In the first episode, we're introduced to the town of Winden in 2019, and we meet the main character of the show, Jonas Conwald, whose father, Michael Conwald, has just committed suicide. From there, we get to know a bunch more of the main cast of characters. One of the smartest things Dark did was make every major character part of one of four families. Conwald, Nielsen, Doppler, and Tiedemann. When the plot gets big and messy later, those last names help you keep everyone organized in your mind. Still, it helps to have the family tree in front of you while you're watching. So as for the people introduced in the first episode, there's Jonas, his dead father Michael, and his mother Hannah. And for the Nielsen family, there's Marta Nielsen, Jonas's love interest, her older brother Magnus, her younger brother Mikkel, her police officer father Ulrich, and her mother Katarina. Hannah and Ulrich are having an affair, by the way. Jonas's best friend is Bartosz Tiedemann, and his parents are Regina and Alexander. Then there's the Doppler family. Charlotte Doppler is the chief of police. She's married to Peter Doppler, and they have two children, Franziska and Elizabeth. Elizabeth is deaf, so the whole Doppler family knows how to speak sign language. And there's also Peter's father, Helga Doppler, who lives in a nursing home. There are a lot of characters, but the show mainly focuses on Jonas, Ulrich, and Charlotte. Besides Michael's suicide, the big story sweeping the town is that a teenage boy named Eric Obendorf has gone missing. Eric was a drug dealer, and he was known to hang out by the mysterious Winden Caves near the Winden Power Plant. His disappearance bears strange similarities to the disappearance of Ulrich's brother Mads near those same caves 33 years ago. At the end of episode 1, pretty much all the major key characters get together. Jonas, Marta, Barchos, Magnus, Francisca, Mikkel, to go explore the caves. But then there's a roar, and flickering lights, and they all run away. But in the process, Mikkel disappears. There we have our opening mystery. These caves, where there occurred three separate incidents of vanishing children. Two in the present, and one in the past. Where did these kids go? What's so special about these caves? We soon find out more. A boy's body turns up as the police search for Mikkel but this body has a Walkman on it, and other markers from the 1980s. The implication is clear. This is the body of Mads Nielsen, and he's had his eyes burnt out. Later we see Eric strapped to a chair with a cloaked figure getting his eyes burnt out in the same way. And Mikkel? He wanders out of the caves and finds himself in Winden in the year 1986. Somehow, the Winden Caves allow people who enter them to time travel. Mikkel transported from the present day to the 1980s, and Mad's body transported from the 1980s to today. But it gets weirder. We follow Mikkel as he explores 1980s Winden. He meets a bunch of teenage versions of the parent characters from before, and we also meet some new characters from the previous generation. 
Like, Ulrich and Mads' parents are Jana and Tronta Nielsen. Regina's mother, Claudia Tiedemann, is the director of the power plant, and her father, Egon Tiedemann, is the chief of police. Nickel wanders until he finds Ines Conwald, who takes him in. And then comes the first big twist of the story. Nickel Nielsen never gets back to his own time period. Ines adopts him, he changes his name to Michael Conwald, and he later grows up to be Jonas's father. Yeah, I told you there were time travel shenanigans in the show. That also means that Jonas is currently crushing on his aunt. Ugh. Now we understand the central conceit of the story. Time traveling caves. The show constantly jumps between the present, the 80s, and later the 50s to explore all the mind-bending mysteries and show how it all connects together. Since we're dealing with a closed loop kind of time travel, where there's no changing in the future and everything has already happened, most of the mysteries involve presenting a strange situation and then slowly revealing the time travel shenanigans that caused it. There are also some smaller questions that pop up in the first few episodes and are relevant later. There's definitely something sketchy going on at the power plant, and its director, Alexander Tiedemann, is totally hiding something. Helga Doppler has a badly scarred face, and seems to know a bit about everything that's happening, but he's too senile to explain it. The Anfang is das Ende. Und das Ende ist der Anfang. There's this book called A Journey Through Time by H.G. Tanhouse that keeps popping up. Birds keep dying all over town for some reason. Of course, there's a creepy torture room. And there are not one, but two mysterious men who have shown up in town with unknown agendas. A bearded guy who stalks Jonas that the show only refers to as The Stranger, and a creepy guy who goes by the name Noah. Throughout season one, various characters investigate the strange happenings in the town. Ulrich searches for his missing son, Mikkel, unsuccessfully. Charlotte digs into the wider pattern of missing children, uncovering some other secrets in the process. Like the fact that her husband Peter is secretly gay. Awkward. And the stranger keeps leaving little hints for Jonas to help him investigate the caves. This leads Jonas to find a door underground with the words Sic Mundus Creatus Est written on it. Latin for, thus the world was created. Jonas also makes a trip through the cave to 1986 and then back again. As Ulrich investigates, he comes to believe that Helga Doppler was involved in Mad's disappearance all those years ago. In the present, Helga remembers some horrible trauma, including being trapped in that torture bunker we keep seeing. Helga runs off to the caves, and Ulrich follows him, and Ulrich winds up traveling back to 1953. Old Helga disappears, but Ulrich stumbles onto the young boy version of Helga. Ulrich believes that if he kills Helga as a boy here, he can prevent Mads and Mikkel from dying. So he bashes young Helga's head with a rock, not killing him, but leaving his face mutilated. This is what happened to Helga's face. And Ulrich ends up being right about Helga, but not for the reason he thinks. This experience was traumatic for Helga, driving him to join up with Noah to build their own time machine and change history, using children as test subjects. Noah, by the way, lives in 1953 as the town's priest. Helga works with Noah until 1986, where his old 2019 self comes out of the caves to warn his younger 1986 self that Noah is a liar. After that, Helga stops. But by then, Noah and Helga have already kidnapped and killed several children. For most of season one, we get periodic scenes where the Stranger and HG Tenhouse talk about time and space and black holes. The Stranger keeps talking about finding a way to stop all this and fix whatever is wrong with Winden. The Stranger has some sort of broken device that Tenhouse built in the past that allows the user to time travel. There's an old woman floating around in all three timelines, which we soon find out is old Claudia. She visits Tenhouse in 1953 and gives him blueprints for building the time machine that the stranger has. Noah kidnaps Jonas to be the next torture bunker test subject. The stranger is also there, and Jonas asks him for help, but the stranger says that he can't. He has to let this happen to Jonas to avoid a paradox, because, he said, he is the older version of Jonas. My name is Jonas Kahnwald. Alles, was du erlebst, habe ich bereits erlebt. Ich habe sogar dieses Gespräch hier schon mal geführt, nur war ich damals auf der anderen Seite. Everything The Stranger has done in this first season has been an attempt to destroy the wormhole that connects 2019, 1986, and 1953 to avoid all the suffering that it caused. But Noah has a conversation with Bartosz, and Noah claims that The Stranger is working under old Claudia, who lied to him. The Stranger takes his repaired time travel device into the caves and sets it off. This causes lights to flicker all over all three time periods, but whatever he does, it doesn't work. And young Jonas is thrown from the bunker into the future, the year 2052. We learn that Noah is part of a group called Sic Mundus, which is why that phrase has been popping up all this time. Their leader is Adam, 
mysterious, bald, disfigured man. On Adam's orders, Noah is searching for the missing pages to a notebook which records all of the time-traveling incidents in Winden. Another member of this group is Agnes Nielsen, Ulrich's grandmother, who is also apparently Noah's sister. In the 50s, Egon arrests Ulrich for attacking young Helga Doppler. Ulrich ends up in a mental institution and stays there for the rest of his life. Egon visits an old Ulrich in the 80s while investigating Mads' disappearance and begins to understand the time travel at play. A federal investigator named Clausen comes from out of town to help figure out where all the missing people in town are going. He quickly finds that something is up with Alexander Tiedemann, who he discovers was named Boris Newall before he changed his name, married Regina, and hid out in Winden. Old Claudia influences her younger self into getting a portable time machine, and we watch her time travel for the first time. Shortly after, Old Claudia confronts Noah, and he shoots her. But not before Claudia shakes Noah's faith in Adam. In the future, Jonas learns that an apocalyptic event occurred on June 27, 2020, at the power plant. He joins up with the survivors, led by an adult Elizabeth Doppler. In the power plant, he sees an orb of light called the God Particle. By touching this, he's able to time travel, but it takes him back to 1921 instead of the present. He's trapped there because the caves only connect the 50s, the 80s, and the present. But while he's there, he meets Sigmundus and Adam. And Adam, it's revealed that this is yet another version of Jonas, one much older who has become disfigured after so much time traveling. Somehow, sometime in the future after Teen Jonas and the Stranger Jonas, he switched from wanting to stop the apocalypse to wanting to cause it. Throughout the show, Charlotte Doppler has been gradually piecing together all of this. Generally, she's consistently a separate two behind the audience, but eventually she puts enough together to have a working theory of what's going on. She begins to talk to some of the other adults in town, like Hannah and Katerina. Charlotte also visits H.D. Tanhouse, who by the way was her adopted father, and she meets Noah, who is defected from Sigmundus and reveals that he is Charlotte's father. Then a few episodes later, we learn that future Elizabeth is the one who had a child with Noah and is Charlotte's mother. Yeah, so that means that both Charlotte and Elizabeth are their own grandmothers. The teens in town are also doing some investigating. Bartosz has gotten a portable time machine from Noah. He, Marta, Magnus, and Francisca all use it to do some time traveling of their own. Adam sends Jonas through the God Particle to prevent his father's suicide, create a paradox, and break this impossible knot of time travel and suffering. He goes uh, back slash forward in time to talk to his father the day before he killed himself. But as they talk, Michael says that he has to kill himself. Otherwise, Mikkel will never go into the past, and Jonas will never be born. It turns out Jonas visiting him was the reason he killed himself on that particular day. It's revealed that Clausen has an ulterior motive for coming to Winden. He's looking for his brother's murderer. And wouldn't you know it, Alexander Tiedemann is probably the guy who killed him, which is why he changed his name and came here. It's almost time for the apocalypse. Several important characters who know what's coming have hidden inside a fallout shelter, including Jonas and Marta. Noah is there too, and by now he's completely turned against Adam. But Adam shows up, has his followers execute Noah, and then shoots Marta in the chest. This is apparently to motivate Jonas to go down a certain path in his personal timeline and ensure that he becomes Adam. Meanwhile, above ground, Clausen gets a warrant to search the power plant and finds a stash of nuclear waste that Alexander had hidden there, left over from an accident in the 80s. He opens them, and the waste coalesces into the God Particle, exploding and causing the apocalypse. Jonas grieves over Marta, but then another Marta shows up. Season 3 adds a whole new layer of complexity to the mix. There's a second, alternate version of the world that's pretty similar, but slightly different. The main difference for our purposes is that Marta fulfills the same role Jonas does in the first world. Alternate Marta discovered time travel, watched her Jonas die, and grew up to be an old lady who was the equivalent of Adam, named Eve. It's this Marta who came to Jonas after the apocalypse. Bartosz, Magnus, Franziska, and the Stranger all travel to 1888 after the apocalypse and get stuck there. While they're there, a member of Sigmundus travels to meet them, Silja Tiedemann. She's the child of Hannah Conwald and Egon Tiedemann, from when Hannah travels to the 1950s and has an affair with the young Egon. Silja and Bartosz fall in love and have two children. The first one grows up to be Noah, although his real name is Hanno Tauber. The second is Agnes Nielsen. So if you're keeping track, 
That means that pretty much every member of all four main families is the product of an endless loop, with a child late in the timeline going back and beginning their family line. Crazy, right? Oh, but it gets even crazier. There's this weird trio of people. A child, a middle-aged man, and an old man, who are clearly all the same person at different stages in life, going around killing people to make sure things happen the way they did. We don't know anything about them at first, but eventually, Jonas and alternate world Marta, um, get busy, and Marta becomes pregnant. That baby, the child of both worlds, later grows up to be those three people. And he has a child with Agnes Nielsen, siring the whole rest of the Nielsen line, and doubly confirming that all related characters in both versions of reality are living paradoxes. Except for a few members of the Tiedemann family, and anybody who married into all this later down the timeline, like Hannah, Peter, and Katarina. Everybody got that? I skimmed over a lot of things, but that's basically the entire plot of the show up to the finale. You can see how there are tons of small details and questions that are slowly tied together into one big plot. And all this is front and center. It's the thing you tuned in to see. The main thing motivating the audience to keep watching is finding out more information about what's happening, gathering details in hope of cracking the questions at the heart of the story. It's not the longest show out there, sitting at only three seasons, but the story sure feels long. There's a lot of plot packed into these episodes, and the story sure is big enough to work as a satisfying mystery box. Its reveals are well paced, and there's never any doubt that everything we're seeing is diegetic. Dark has been perfect so far. We'll see how well it sticks the landing at the end. But first... Dark has pretty much every mystery box trope in it somewhere. Of course, it's all about time travel. Its non-linear story structure is what it's built around. The secret organization organizing everything behind the scene? Sigmundus. There are quite a few characters who know critical information but won't tell the audience. In season 1, that's Helga Doppler, because he's too senile to explain what he's been through. And people like The Stranger, Old Claudia, and Adam have clearly been through a ton, but their experiences and their motives remain a mystery for a long time. Oh, and I'm adding two new tropes to this list. The first one is a stock scene that I've seen show up in tons of mystery box stories, where someone or something is about to drop a big reveal, and then they get interrupted. It's a little meta joke meant to tease the audience. I always appreciate seeing it, because it shows me that the writers understand how important the slow drip of information is. They understand how audiences are approaching the story. Anyway, in Dark, this happens at the very end of the show. There's this guy Waller, a cop with an eye patch who mostly floats around in the background of the show but doesn't do much. You're naturally drawn to the eye patch because the assumption is we'll see how he got it earlier in the timeline. But nope, instead we get this scene. Hey, Paul, good. Sieht viel besser aus. Du hast uns nie erzählt, was da eigentlich genau passiert ist. Letzten Sommer ist. It's a fun little way to let the audience know that, yep, we knew you were wondering about that, and no, it's not something that actually matters to the story. The second new trip I want to introduce is the conspiracy board. You know, when somebody puts up a bunch of photos and notes and newspaper clippings connected with string to try and solve some big mystery. It's a fun moment where the characters in the story are pretty much doing the same thing that the audience is doing. Desperately collecting information. In Dark, Charlotte Doppler makes one of these in her secret fallout shelter. For how complicated the show has gotten by the final episodes, the ending is surprisingly simple and elegant. See, Adam's whole goal was to prevent Jonas and Marta's child from being born, to stop the mess of paradoxes, or the not as they call it, from happening. He succeeds in his plan in killing pregnant alternate universe Marta, but that doesn't work because that was not the root cause of all this. There's a third world, the original world. There, H.G. Tanhouse invented a time machine to prevent the death of his entire family, but doing so split the world into three, and that's what caused all this. Jonas and Marta enter the original world, and they prevent Tanhouse's family from dying. This undoes the knot and resets the world back to normal. Almost every character ceases to exist now that the paradoxes that created them are resolved. The final scene of the show has the handful of characters who weren't paradoxes having a dinner party. Hannah, pregnant with Waller's child, says she's thinking of naming her child Jonas. I think Jonas is a nice name. Jonas. 
By the time we get to the ending, basically everything has been explained in one way or another. Yeah, you might need pages and pages of notes to make sure you have it all straight, but it's mostly all there. There are a handful of small threads that don't get resolved. I already mentioned the thing about Waller's eye patch, and the whole Alexander murdered Clausen's brother plotline kind of fizzles out. But neither of these are especially critical to the main plot. I was satisfied with the story's conclusion. There are a lot of really good mystery box stories where you can draw direct lines between the final reveals and the clues left in the very beginning. I wouldn't say that Dark does that exactly, but I have a hard time believing it would even be possible to write a show like this without having it planned all out from the start. As far as I can tell, there isn't a single continuity error in all of this time travel. That's freaking impressive. Well done, Dark. Then, finally, let's talk about the characters of the show. Do the mysteries of Dark intertwine with the characters' emotional arcs and help you get invested in their journeys? Or do the mysteries muddle their arcs and distance you from them? It was a tough call, but I'd have to lean towards the latter. Dark has a few really good character moments sprinkled through its runtime that I really like. The premise of time traveling across generational gaps allows for characters to meet up with different versions of themselves to explore how much they've changed, and it gives the opportunity for them to interact with their loved ones in ways they couldn't or wouldn't otherwise. But these scenes are often few and far between. This is very much a plot-driven show. The mysteries get basically all the attention and screen time. Most of the show is focused on details and moments, cause and effect. There's so much capital P plot to keep track of, the audience doesn't have room in their head to get emotionally invested in the characters. I think it all comes down to time travel as a genre. You can have a character-driven time travel story, with very loose mechanics that essentially serve as an excuse to put the characters in interesting situations, but when you start specifying the rules of time travel and structuring the story around the nitty-gritty of how it works, the plot and mechanics take over the story. And that's too bad. I think the show could have done with way more, say, interplay between the three versions of Jonas. But they only get, like, one or two scenes with each other each. There's so much you can do with that, meeting a version of yourself with wildly differing views. In this case, I- oh, What? Hello? <laughs> I can see... everything. You! How is this happening? Why do you only respond to me while I'm recording? Right, right. Are we still doing this? I mean, you're me. Why do you keep sabotaging everything I do? It only hurts both of us. Will you shut that music off? Thank you. Yeah, I read that thing you put at the end of the last video. And Look, I, I feel for you. Editing's hard. I remember how tough it was during the first few videos. After that, it's all kind of a blur, but come on. There might not be that many people watching them, but... I care about these videos. I want them to be nice. I want you to stop messing with them. I... I record them because... I... That's not... I don't have to do anything you say. No! You... Ugh. What did you have in mind? Trend chasing? A collab with a bigger channel? Telling people to like and subscribe? I'll even do that. Ugh. Okay. Before I go, here are my favorite moments from the show. I mentioned how plot generally overtakes character in this story, but here are a few spots where the characters truly get to shine. Egon meeting old Ulrich. Was wollen Sie hier? My only aim is to take many lives. The more the better I feel. Warum hörst du sowas? My only aim is to take many lives. The more, the better I feel. Ich kenne das. 
Was hat das zu bedeuten? Das bedeutet, dass du Trottel immer noch nichts verstanden hast. Claudia reading in the future that Egon died under mysterious circumstances, and then when she goes back to help him, she ends up being the one who kills him. Let's move. The reveal that Adam is Jonas from the future, it's such a mind-blowing moment. And Peter dying to save Elizabeth. Yeah, so Dark is a nearly perfect mystery box story. It's taken the elements of so many previous mystery box TV shows and synthesized something that puts this genre formula to great use. It's a lot, though. Maybe too much for most people, even people who already like expending the effort engaging with a mystery box story. But still, I am very impressed with the structure and attention to detail that this show pulled off, and it's a shining example to what this genre is capable of. Dark gets a final mystery box rating of 9 out of 10. What do you mean? No, I don't want to. I'll see what I can do. I hate you.